The breathtaking sights and great depths of Edel's Nest sinkhole are well recognized. It is regarded as one of the most spectacular cave diving sites in the world. However, because of the fact that it has taken many lives, this cave is also exceedingly dangerous. We encourage you to subscribe to our channel for more thrilling tales about cave diving. The Chasahawitska Wildlife Management Area WMA, in West Central Florida contains the incredible underwater cave system known as the Eagle's Nest Sinkhole. You would never believe such a lovely environment lies inside this sinkhole if you only look at its exterior. One of the few stunning sinkholes. The sinkhole has a rough entrance and tunnels, an unappealing surface area. It's a dangerous beauty, if you will. Of course, it is magnificent inside, but the cave itself can also be hazardous. What are those depressing objects at the surface of this sinkhole represent? The water appears greenish at the surface, resembling an aldefilled pond. It is dark and hard to see through, unlike the surrounding Wikiwaki and Buford Springs, whose waters are perfectly clear. It appears as though alligators, mosquitoes, and ticks reside there. Despite all of these demoralizing views above the water, a few seasoned scuba divers have entered the underwater cave networks. The Eagle's Mess is in fact a heaven to them. It is an outstanding underwater cave system that deserves praise. The Florida Aquifer State and the current level of rainfall have a significant impact on this sinkhole's visibility at this time. A message board in the Eagle's Nest sinkhole displays the various diving conditions that divers who have been there before have experienced. The main circumstances are listed on the message board as unlimited visibility and diving by braille with zero visibility. When you arrive at this sinkhole, you will frequently find that tannin has been applied on the surface. A natural organic coloring dye is tannin. The water becomes darker than usual as a result. Sometimes the water can be gin clear under certain favorable circumstances. It feels like you are in a completely different universe when you dare to enter it. It is all at once interesting, gorgeous, and dangerous. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole is a terrible cave diving site and should only be attempted by certified and experienced divers. Finding your way around the cave system is another precaution you need to take. You may very easily get lost. It's a terrible, uninviting sinkhole. Despite the fact that it is not advised for professional divers to dive alone there, these divers must nonetheless get information from divers who have already done so or even use them as guides so they could be aware of the possible situation of things to face inside the cave. The 70 feet long channels into the Eagle's Nest Cave systems are constrictive and tiny, and you must cram yourself through them. Often, getting inside with your diving gear presents a number of difficulties. There are broad tunnels characterized with fantastic names like the Pit, the Super Chamber, and the Ballroom. Although the cave system is spectacular, numerous amateur and inexperienced divers have perished here due to the high risk involved in exploring it. Judy Bedard and her longtime partner Rudy Banks were scheduled to go on the dive expedition to the interesting cave systems of Eagle's Nest Sinkhole on September 11, 2005. The age of Judy Bedard, a cave diver, was 48. She was a diver with a twist, and she had previously gone on multiple diving excursions with her buddies. Judy held a diving certification. She was employed by Tampa General Hospital as a registered nurse. In Florida's Tampa, she resided. At 4.30 p.m., Rudy and Judy jumped into the water. They started the dive after a short period of time. The beautiful top-notch underwater cave system is hidden beneath the surface of Eagle's Nest when you enter it. It is made up of a labyrinth that descends 91 meters below the Earth's surface. Over a mile long, the intricate network of passageways is so impressive that it may be dangerous. A section of the cavern known as the Pit can be found in the tunnel system's downstream portion, which includes many rooms that are at least 300 feet deep. The tunnel dips to a height of 300 feet, hence the name Pit, 91 meters. Juby and Rudy had just started their dive and were moving inside the cave somewhat slowly. Judy used an oxygen-only tank until she was 30 feet in the air, 9 meters. At this depth, she switched to her nitrox tank. That is an amalgam of nitrogen and oxygen. She had a change since different gas mixtures are needed for diving at various depths. The dive was going well until they descended 130 feet. She started to experience some problems. Her tools started to exhibit some technical issues. She changed her Trimix tank, a primary tank which was filled with a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium at this depth. For the depth she had just achieved, this primary tank was required. Unfortunately, the quantity of these three gases in the main tank was incorrect. Judy returned to her nitrox tank after seeing the incident, according to Bank. Both divers started to climb back to the surface as a result. To prevent decompression sickness, often known as bends, ascent in cave diving should be gradual rather than rapid. Gas embolism may also result from rapid decompression. When blood flow is hindered by bubbles or blood clot in the bloodstream, it is called embolism. 
Time is not on their side right now to start a slow decompression process. Judy has been consuming nearly no oxygen and excessive amounts of helium, due to an error in her primary tank mixes. Judy had passed out by the time they got to 100 feet. When they reached a depth of 60 feet, though, her respiration became labored. Rudy wasn't sure which course to take at this time. They are still 60 feet below the surface and Judy is dying. Judy's traumatic condition will worsen if he climbs quickly because her body already lacked enough oxygen. If he climbs slowly, Judy will finally perish from oxygen deprivation. The former is preferable since she has a chance of recovering from the decompression sickness as opposed to simply passing away inside the cave. Rudy quickly ascended after that and carried her to the surface. He now required assistance in reviving Judy. Who could be of assistance? After their dives, James Gary, a dive control board member at the University of South Florida and Greg Stanton, a former diving safety officer at Florida State University, came to assist Rudy. It's sad, according to Greg, that the ascension marked the beginning of a kaleidoscope of problems and the injuries under which she now endures. She also experienced arterial gas emboli. Judy had no pulse when she came to the surface. Blood and foam were flowing out of her mouth as her eyes were open. Dan Pellin, a Spring Hill resident who was visiting Eagle's Nest to take some pictures, was stopped by James. James used Pellin's phone to dial 911. Pellin assisted Rudy while he performed CPR on Judy. CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, was required at this point due to Judy's condition. It is a medical procedure used as a life-saving emergency technique to revive someone whose heart has stopped beating. Around 15 minutes after they started CPR, Judy's heart started beating again. CPR was used to restart her breathing, but she hadn't yet come to. She needed immediate medical assistance, but there was no one nearby to provide it right now. The Eagle's Nest sinkhole's remote location and unpaved entry posed the biggest obstacles to receiving recovery assistance there. Despite the improvements, the roadways still have a rough texture and numerous huge potholes. In the event of an accident, it is exceedingly challenging to obtain assistance here. Regarding Judy's case, inadequate supplies and transportation issues had a significant impact on the medical team's response. Without an IV drip, they had to rush the victim while using a sport utility vehicle backboard to transport Judy to the hospital, the ambulance, and the chopper or waiting at the edge of the woodland. According to Stephen Farmer, a fish and wildlife inspector, Judy's Tremix tanks had poorly mixed gases, and there had been a poor investigation of the quantity of gases in her tanks. All three of these factors contributed to her suffering severe injuries at the cave location. She neglected to check the isolation valve, which is connected to the manifold that joins the two tanks, therefore she left it closed. According to several experts, Judy was in charge of her equipment. Before beginning their dive, all divers must check their breathing gas levels. If she had checked the isolation valve, she would have discovered that the tanks weren't pressurized equally, which probably wouldn't have caused her to postpone the dive due to other issues. Rudy was dissatisfied the entire time and unable to relax due to Judy's condition. Judy was transported by air to Shans, where her condition was deemed serious. Expectations for a full recovery were extremely low during the first several weeks. Judy's survival for the first 24 hours following the plunge astounded the medics. After being removed from a hyperbaric chamber to treat the air embolisms, her kidneys failed and she had many heart attacks. The use of hyperbaric oxygen treatment is a useful technique for accelerating the rate at which gas bubbles are expelled by the lungs. It is a hard reality for friends and other divers who know Judy as vivacious. She was a happy person, entertaining to be around. That she met with such a tragedy was regrettable. Judy was taken to Tampa General Hospital, where she started her rehabilitation. Two months after the tragedy in November, she finally regained consciousness. John stated, I recall waking up and being immobile. I was wearing a tracheostomy tube and my legs had gotten weaker. I had a oh my god moment. Judy had experienced cardiac arrest, respiratory failure, various organ issues, cognitive decline, and post-traumatic amnesia while she was in the hospital. A person who has experienced this much trauma is often expected to survive with brain impairment, physical restrictions in the arms and legs, and maybe paralysis. Judy needed assistance getting into and out of bed when she first started. She had trouble keeping her balance. Even with the help of a walker with wheels, she ran out of breath after about 10 steps. She endured protracted therapy for months. She had been able to walk more than 300 feet after around 5 weeks, 91 meters. Her recovery was hailed as miraculous by one of her doctors, who noted her lucky life history. On the brain injury team at the rehabilitation facility, her former physical therapist added, For what she had, it was one of the best recoveries I've ever seen. After leaving the hospital in January 2006, Judy continued her outpatient therapy for a further six months. During that time, she focused on building her stamina, flexibility, and coordination. 
The following summer, Judy accomplished something that had previously seemed unthinkable. She went on an open water dive into the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Newport Ritchie, with Rudy, who was now her husband. Throughout the months of her recovery, she had been daydreaming about it as she was in bed. She returned to work at Tampa General in June 2007 as an operating room nurse, but she ultimately chose to transfer to the medical records department. Judy preferred not to work a lot of overtime since she wanted to spend more time diving. Juby shook off the rust and a load of fears and resumed his tour of the underwater caverns. She has attempted a number of locations including Peacock Springs in North Florida. We appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. If you like what you saw, click the bell icon, like, and subscribe buttons to be notified when we post another thrilling cave diving story.